Find how many four digit numbers, <coughs> excuse me, can be formed using the digits 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9 are what we get to choose from. For the intents and purposes of what I want to illustrate to you, I'm just interested in part A. No digit is to be repeated. So when we think about the permutation for this, right, if we think about our notation, we would say, using this um, permutation notation, we would say, I've got five things to choose from. I would say 5p. Now, have a look at what the question says. Um, how many numbers, digits, rather, do I want to choose? I want to choose four of them, right? I want a four-digit number, so I'd say 5p4. Are you okay with that? Now, I want to cycle back to the definition, because you could just go to your calculator, you could just punch that number straight in, and you would get an answer, right? But I actually want to think about this just a little bit further, okay? Let's think about this in terms of the factorial definition of 5p4, okay? If I say uh, this is a fraction, right? What's on the numerator? What factorial will be there? Look, it's in your, it's in your notes like half a page ago, right? It's going to be 5 factorial. That's how many things you have to choose from. But then on the denominator, what do I get? What's in the brackets? It'll be, yeah, 5 minus 4, right? 5 take away 4. Factorial. Um, 5 factorial happens to be, I think, 120 from memory. And then on the bottom there, you've got 1 factorial. Now, 1 factorial, of course, is just 1 times, well, it's, just, it's just 1. So you're just going to get 120 out of that. That should be your answer. Okay. But we had an interesting conversation down the front when, um, you know, you can misread a question like this very easily to say, oh, I've got 5 things to choose from. I'm just going to make a five-letter word. Now, something really interesting comes out that you can observe and think about this with me if you accidentally solve that question. If you're choosing five digits to make a five-digit number, you would not say 5p4, you would say 5p5. Five. Okay. Now, again, if we think about what this means in factorial notation, there are two things that I want to point out. Firstly, um, if you have a look at this down the bottom, what do you get? On the bottom, that 5 minus 5 is just going to give you zero. So you have zero factorial on the bottom. Okay. Now, what this means is, because zero factorial is just equal to one, how many ways are there to arrange to permute zero objects? One way. Here it is. There it is. This, this is just a single way, right? So this thing is just equal to five factorial, which we knew from the beginning, right? Like, see this situation here, three factorial, that's three p three, right? But then you realize, wait a second, if, if that is 1, just like this is 1, then these two things are the same. That 5p4 and 5p5, in fact, are equal to one another. That seems a bit counterintuitive because it feels like when you're choosing you know, more numbers, you should have more choices. Okay? Now, I asked you guys to have a think about this down the front because they stumbled upon this question. I don't know if you guys came up with an answer. Did you come up with an answer for it? Okay, we can all come up with an answer for it because the answer is already on the board and presumably in your books if you kept up your working, right? Why would 5p5 and 5p4 be the same thing? Well, let's go to this scenario here, right? Um, 5p4, you're picking out of the digits and you're making a four digit number. So, for example, you might choose the numbers 5, 6, 7, and 8, okay? So, here is one of the choices, one of the permutations, right? If I now change this situation and say, now I'm interested in five digit numbers, how many choices do I have for this last number? I've only got, I've only got one choice, right? So out of this particular option, right, how many branches go off of this? And the answer is just, just one branch, right? The branch that goes to nine, which is exactly what we already observed over here. Do you see this, right? If you're picking the, um, the nth option, there are no more choices. Each time you're only getting one choice out of each one, which is why you can see from this tree diagram that 3p2, which is this part here, 3p2 equals the same as 3p3. Do you, do you see it? You understand what's going on? So that's why numerically you can see this pattern, which it's, they're the same, it's the same problem that you're solving, even though it sounds like it would be different. Okay. All right, so that's the first thing I wanted to illustrate. You probably did five and they just blew right through it, but I think about these situations before you go on too quickly. Now, can I ask all of you to have a look at 19 with me? Most of you, I would expect, are not up to 19 yet. So I actually want to do this one together because it's got a little more complexity to the situation than the previous questions. So have a look at 19. Find how many arrangements of the letters of the word behaving, and I want to have a look at all of these together with you. So here's part A. 
How many arrangements end in ing? Uh, sorry, it's just ng, isn't it? Is that right? End in ng? Okay. So, normally, if we're having a look at the word behaving, the first thing you do is you'd count the number of letters, right? Because that's the number of things you have to choose from. How many letters are there in the word behaving? There are eight letters, right? So normally you would start off by saying 8P whatever, right? But because they've said in this first part, we want all the words to end in NG, right? If you think about this, again, go back to, um, you know, when you were doing our boxes, right? If you drew eight boxes here, uh, uh, can you draw this with me actually? Um, here we go, I'll halve it and then I'll halve again and then I'll halve one more time. There are my eight boxes, okay? Here, the condition means you don't have free choice for the entire thing. You can't just start over here and say eight choices, right? In fact, the first thing you should deal with is this restriction. It's like when we um, had, had conditional probability. Do you remember when we dealt with that? And we'd say, here's your dot diagram, here's all of your options. But if they provide some condition, you have to knock out some of the options and say these are not part of the sample space. Same deal here, right? So if I end in NG, Okay, there's my ending, it's fixed in place. The only arrangements I'm interested are the ones where this is already there. Now when I have a look at the beginning here, how many choices do I have for the first spot? I don't have eight anymore, do I? Yeah, I only have six. I've only got B, E, H, A, V, and I. So I would say six choices, and now I would say five, and then four, and then three, and then two, and then one. Okay, does this make sense? So this is going to be um, 6 factorial or 6p6 six six, if you like, and that's going to be all the options once you've taken these out of the running. Does this make sense? Okay, now when we push on this a little further, it gets more complicated because sometimes it's not always fixed in a particular position. Part B says, oh actually, I have to get to part C, I'll, I'll wait to that one. So part B says begins with three vowels, begins with three vowels. So. I'm going to write that down. So now when I have a look here and I draw out my slots here, there's four, there's eight. Okay. So when I have a look at these three up the front, I don't have like eight options to choose from because I have to begin with one of the three vowels. So how many choices do I have for the first of those three vowels? There are three vowels. I can choose any of them. There will be three choices for that first one, right? Um, when I choose the second letter, it'll be two. I've got two vowels left. There's only one vowel left at that point, so three times two times one. And now I've dealt with the vowels, so now I can move on to the rest of the word. How many choices will I have for this spot? Yeah, it's the five consonants, right? Then five, four, three, two, one, and off you go, okay? So this is gonna be three factorial multiplied by five factorial, and that will give you Fewer options again because you're even more restricted, okay? And the last one, yeah, I'm gonna put it up here. The last one I think is the most interesting because it extends this naturally to say, well, what if I let the vowels go anywhere? Is that what it says? Three vowels occurring together, but it doesn't say where they are, okay? So for part C, three vowels together. Just put your pens down and watch the way I do this one because I'm going to do it a little bit differently to the others, okay? For each of these situations, I was dealing with eight letters and I had an eight letter word to create. So that's why I created eight slots, okay? But here, I want to reconceive of the problem a little differently, right? If the three vowels always have to be together, but they can be anywhere within the word, start, middle, end, etc., okay? I'm going to think of the three vowels as an object on their own. Let me say that again. The three vowels, right? I'm not, I can't place them separately, right? So I'm gonna think of them as like one whole object which I'm gonna place in one of the slots. Now, if the three vowels all together are one object, how many different objects do I have to choose from when I use all the letters? You have the five consonants, right? And then you've got this super object, a sixth object, which is all the vowels all together. Does that make sense? So now I'm going to, instead of, you can pick up your pen again, instead of doing eight boxes, I'm gonna do six. Okay, now, I've got my six objects, my five consonants and my, my super vowel object, right? So if I think of them each, I would say, well, I've got, I can pick any of those six to put in the first spot, because the vowels can be any, they can be the start, 
like here, right? The vowels could be next as well, so I'm going to go by 5, by 4, by 3, by 2, by 1. Okay, so now I've placed all the consonants are somewhere, and the vowels together are somewhere in that spot. Okay, but now suppose, suppose the vowels are here. Right? Suppose I put them in there. Well, this vowel object has more complexity. There's three spots that I can put those vowels into within that super object, right? So how many choices will I have each time? Three, then two, then one. Does that make sense? So you can see here, I've got to multiply all these together, which will give me the six factorial. But then I've also got to arrange the vowels between themselves, which is three factorial, which would give you more options. Okay. Now, last thing I'm going to say is, what is the connection between part B and part C? I mean the connection between the answers, right? Our answer over there was three factorial times five factorial. Here my answer is six factorial times three factorial. Hmm. So in other words, my answer here Right? To get to here, all I do is multiply by, what's the difference? It's just 6. Now why should that be? Hmm. Well, here's one version of those. Right. This is the version where it's in the first spot. Okay. But I could also put them in the second spot, or the third, or the fourth, or the fifth, or the sixth. In other words, it's like this situation, but I have to do this six times because it doesn't have to be at the start, it could be the next one over. Or the next one over, and I could do this one, two, three, four, five, six times. Okay, so I could get from here to there just by saying it's the same thing, but you don't have to put it at the start. You could put it in the second spot, or the third, or the fourth, or the fifth, or the sixth. That's why there are six more, six as many times as options. Okay, so when you um, there's two things I want to pull out of that. Number one, um, first deal with your restrictions. Okay, if they give you a condition, they're like we want to meet this first, then deal with that first, and then see what is left. Secondly, if they give you some condition that within itself you can rearrange, then you need to think about that on its own as its own sub-problem within the problem that you're solving. Okay?